Coming up, scuba diving as rehab for injured veterans. You come home and, and things just seem different. So to be able to escape and to get into an underwater world like that, it's just, it really is, it's, uh, it's another world. Meet the Cherokee Nation citizen helping injured veterans heal. Cherokee songs passed down through generations. And I do truly believe that it's the, the singing, our belief, that keeps us together. The mission of a Cherokee family to preserve the link that holds them together. He's been called the father of Native fashion. Lloyd was one of the first uh, Native fashion designers, but he was the first one to bring it to a very successful and popular venture. We look back at the life and influence of Cherokee Nation citizen Lloyd Kiva New. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. Wado. Ocio, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. And welcome to the John Ross Museum in Park Hill, Oklahoma. This is one of many historic sites in the Cherokee Nation. First up today, we go far south of the Cherokee Nation to the U.S. territory, Puerto Rico, where a Cherokee named John W. Thompson runs a nonprofit changing the lives of injured veterans. You know, back on the battlefield, they had all those booms and explosions going off. Now you're underwater and you, know, you don't hear anything except for the bubbles coming out of your regulator or maybe the, the reef crackling. It's a very tranquil environment. My name is John Thompson. I'm the executive director of SUDS, and SUDS is Soldiers Undertaking Disabled Scuba. This is a nonprofit program based out of Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Rincon, Puerto Rico is kind of our home base, the surf capital of the Caribbean. So it's just got a great vibe. Uh, so I spend the majority of my year here. I have a huge support system in this community. They really roll out the red carpet when I bring warriors down here. I was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, and I grew up in Salisaw, Oklahoma, which is in Sequoia County. Just grew up hunting and fishing and in the outdoors. It's a really cool place to grow up. We always had a small cabin up on Ten Killer, and we would spend our, our whole summers up there. So I've always been around the water, always been on the water, love the water. I am a member of the Cherokee Nation. I'm very proud of it. It's a very important part of my life. I spent seven years uh, in the Army National Guard uh, in an airborne unit. I was a paratrooper and I worked as a guide and instructor running extended expeditions in the Rocky Mountains. So I'd spend my winters down here in the Caribbean diving and then I'd spend my summers in the Rocky Mountains. Back in 2005, I went to the Army Hospital at Walter Reed and it was the height of the war and I walked in, as soon as I walked in, I saw these uh, very young men and women with some pretty horrific injuries and I knew at that moment that I wanted to get involved. I'm a dive instructor, here's all these injured men and women. I'm curious or I wonder if we could use scuba diving to help facilitate their rehabilitation. So I met with the chief physical therapist at Walter Reed. She saw the merit in what I wanted to do and she gave me the green light. Yeah, what's yeah. Uh, I'd like the split ones. You yeah, want to check mine yeah. out? Oh, I've seen those. But typically, we'll have six to eight warriors on a trip, and normally uh, three or four dive staff. We like to have a ratio of one instructor or dive master to, to two warriors. My name is Brian Boone. I was deployed to Afghanistan in 2011 uh, as an EOD tech. 
uh, which is explosive ordnance disposal. We take care of IEDs. My name is Christopher Cowan. I was a corporal in the United States Marine Corps, and I just recently retired. It's definitely a humbling experience. You know, it it you know, shows you like how quick you know things can happen in life and how quickly things can turn around. I don't really take things for granted anymore. In November of 2011, I happened to be with a group of engineers that were doing route clearance packages, and we had taken care of a couple of IEDs, and we're heading back to the FOB, and um, it was just the wrong place, of, you know, wrong time. Our vehicle got hit, my leg got smashed, and uh, life changed at that point, you know? It's kind of like everything you've been doing for your military career. It's like the rug just gets pulled right out from underneath you, and life begins again. No. Just, just relax and breathe normal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John's just one of the most sincere, genuine guys I've met in a long time. The hospitality to open his doors for us to come down here and to teach us scuba is phenomenal. They, they jokingly call a single blow in the amputee's paper cuts. I can do everything I could before, I just have to put on a leg before I do it. When you have other guys, they, they don't have that luxury. So no, I, I, honestly, I don't feel sorry for myself. I mean, it's, it could be a lot worse. When you're rehabbing with guys that are double and triples, and you see the, the, the anguish and the pain that they're going through as they're rehabbing, and you know, Again, just being a baloney is it's almost a blessing in disguise, but at the same time, everybody has their own injuries. You really can't compare yourself to, you know, I, I carried around a lot of guilt for a long time, thinking that, you know, I don't know, it's just hard. It's just hard watching those guys really struggle, and you know they're gonna have serious problems for the rest of their life. Uh, and you come home and, and things just seem different. Um, so to be able to escape and to get into an underwater world like that, it's just, it really is, it's, uh, it's another world. It's awesome. We often hear that when these men and women are, are in the water and underwater, that, that the pain goes away. Once they've gotten injured, have gotten out of the military, they've lost that camaraderie that they had while they're in the military. So we're providing that experience for them when they come on these trips with us. With SUDS in this program, it's not all about diving. I think it's kind of a springboard or a catalyst to help them heal. And I, I'm happy that I can share my passion for the ocean and mountains with our service members who have sacrificed so much. So we, as an American nation, need to give back to our service members who have made that sacrifice. Um, it's, it's the right thing to do. Back here in the Cherokee Nation, there's a place not known to all, but for those who've been there, it can be a spiritual experience. It's a hill in Sequoia County known as Gertie Hill, where the Gertie family meets and they sing. My mama could sing, but she didn't. My dad did. So he, he was the one that uh, introduced me to the Cherokee song. 
all the Cherokees that lived in that area would gather at the, uh, the uh, cemetery and they would sing those songs, Cherokee songs. All my other sisters could sing too, just like my daughters do. They learned the same way, just by hearing. There were churches here and there that still sing Cherokee songs. We would visit, and my daughters were willing to sing with their dad, and we'd all go up there and we sing. Singers include Susan, myself, Brenda, Linda, Elizabeth, Joan, and our mother Wanda, and of course Becky and Janelle, and we are the Gertie family singers. We grew up with our grandparents being right here on our dad's side. You know, so it, the Grandma and Duda's house was right there. My Grandma and Duda were um, stomp dance people at the very beginning. They went to uh, stomp grounds. They went to the ceremonial grounds. And Duda was a leader. He would sing. And that's, that's where I think a lot of the singing that Duda sang uh, came from that. So whenever they started going to church, that's when Duda used to, uh, would lead songs. And he, he had the spirit. He had, you know, he was, he would sing them songs and it would just be, you know, he could fill that whole church building with his voice. Whoever we are comes from them, comes from them teaching us how to be, teaching us how to sing, uh, and teaching us the, how to, how to be, how to be Cherokee. Gertie Hill because there's so many of us that live here. My grandpa's sister lives here. My grandpa actually lives up the hill here. And then his brother lives on the other side of the hill. And my uh, grandpa's dad used to live up here on the hill. His house is gone now. And so I would come down here and spend all summer with my grandparents. So I was down here with my cousins and we'd be running around in the woods. I need that snowball now. All right. <laughs> And just like, just like they're doing now, this is what we would do. There are these songs that we pass down from each generation and the things that we do, the things that we show them, you know, it's, it's just like being a part of this big chain and each one of us is a link and we're just passing this down and hopefully each link is just as strong as the one before it. And maybe one of these days, I'm hoping that my own grandchildren will come out here and play, you know, and my son, maybe will sing the songs like we were singing inside. And they'll ask him, you know, they'll say, how do you know these songs, Edod? You know, who taught them to you? And he'll tell them, your grandma, your grandma taught them to me. I do feel that family life is very important. And uh, I try to keep it that way. And I do truly believe that it's the, the singing, our belief, that keeps us together. Yes, I'll keep on, keep on singing because that is a God-given talent. The spiritual Cherokee songs, uh, they might not <laughs> want me to sing with them, but I'm going to be singing.
In 1886, the Cherokee Nation was completely settled in Indian Territory, land that had been guaranteed to them forever by the United States. However, less than 50 years after removing the tribe from its original homelands, the federal government was already making plans to acquire even more Indian land. On February 8, 1887, Congress passed the General Allotment Act, or Dawes Act, which would change the lives of American Indians forever. Under this act, the United States gained millions of acres of land from citizens of the five civilized tribes in Indian Territory. This seizure provided plenty of land for white homesteaders and cleared the way for Oklahoma statehood in 1907. Henry L. Dawes was the United States congressman who proposed the act. The Dawes Act would abolish each tribe's communal ownership of land and instead allot a certain amount of land to each individual tribal citizen. The rest of the tribe's territories would be deemed surplus and opened for development by non-native settlers and corporations. In 1896, the Dawes Commission entered the Cherokee Nation and began working to formally enroll each citizen, process them with a number, and allot them a certain amount of land. Each Cherokee Nation citizen, including children, was entitled to land worth $325.60 and would include no fewer than 40 acres. To ensure that each citizen was accounted for, the Commission sent locating parties and set up 14 enrollment sites in Tahlequah, Muskogee, and Fort Gibson, among others. Citizens were often required to give testimonies to prove their citizenship or the citizenship of a neighbor or family member. When the land allotments were assigned, many Cherokee citizens' parcels were split up, even in different counties, with surplus land for white settlers in between. The end result was a checkerboard pattern across present-day Oklahoma making Cherokee management of their properties difficult. Cherokee citizens often sold their allotments or had it seized for alleged failure to pay taxes. The Cherokee enrollment process lasted until March 4, 1907, after which no further Indians were eligible to receive a land allotment or tribal citizenship. 41,693 enrollees were ultimately listed, and the Dawes final roles were established as a basis for citizenship in the Cherokee Nation. Every Cherokee Nation citizen today can trace their roots to an ancestor on the Dawes Rolls. Let's talk Cherokee. How are you? Tohiju. Tohiju. I am good. Osta. Osta. I am okay. Orsi. Orsi. I am not good. La Osta Yiki. La Osta Yiki. What's wrong? Kadogu. Kadogu. Cherokee Nation Entertainment has opened its 10th casino and entertainment destination, this one near Grand Lake and Grove, Oklahoma. Area leaders and community members attended a ribbon-cutting grand opening ceremony, officially opening the 39,000-square-foot gaming destination. It features 400 electronic games, a restaurant, a full-service bar, and live music venue. The Rustic Lodge-style venue offers event space for hosting private and community events and an outdoor patio. Cherokee Casino Grove is the tribe's 10th casino location. Cherokee Nation Entertainment currently operates Hard Rock Hotel and Casino Tulsa, nine Cherokee casinos, including a horse racing track, three hotels, three golf courses, and other retail operations. What's good for the Cherokee Nation in this part of the Cherokee Nation is good for Grove. And uh, so it's a win-win. And uh, I think they'll bring more traffic into Grove. I think some folks will stay longer. They'll have one more venue of entertainment. The new casino created 175 new jobs. It's located near Highway 59 and East 250 Road, just northwest of Grove. Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon announced she'll add a new position to her cabinet, State Secretary of Native American Affairs. Former Secretary of State and former Speaker of the House Chris Benge will serve in the newly created position. Benj, who now also serves as the governor's chief of staff, is a Cherokee Nation citizen. Cherokee Nation officials say creating this position will raise the level of importance and better prioritize Native issues in Oklahoma. 
Visitors to the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino Tulsa now have even more amenities to enjoy, with the opportunity to be pampered at our new resort-style spa. The spa at Hard Rock is state-of-the-art with a zen, relaxing atmosphere. The spa offers massages, couples massages, facials, manicures, pedicures, and more. Popular features include the Himalayan sea salt bricks said to create negative ions. Customers are encouraged to stay in the spa beyond their treatments and enjoy the saunas and steam showers. You can come to Hard Rock and get a full experience. Um, the, the spa is just another amenity that keeps us as a market leader. Whether you're at McGill's um, or you're on the gaming floor, staying in the suites, catching a show at the joint, we really have a full experience here. And the spa is just another amenity that keeps us not only current, but really the market leader. The spa employs 19 new spa technicians and staff. A new resort-style pool is under construction now and expected to open later this year. For more Cherokee Nation news, go to anadisco.com or visit our website at oco.tv and click on links mentioned. In the 1950s, American fashion trends took a turn, driven by a Cherokee Nation citizen named Lloyd Kiva New. But just as New left his mark on fashion, he also made a lasting impact on Native arts education. Lloyd Kivanu was really a pathbreaker in Native fashion and, um, and education. He was Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, but spent most of his adult life and career in the Southwest. Lloyd was born uh, near Fairland, Oklahoma, and he grew up on a farm called Timber Hill, which is near the Neosho River. As a child, Lloyd was always drawn to the arts. He recalls making his own pigment from uh, clays found on the farm. His mother and father actually would speak Cherokee to each other, but they didn't teach the children because at the time they thought that was a sign of, you know, not being progressive. If you spoke the language, they wanted the children to have a better life than they did. So he talks about lamenting the fact that he didn't learn the language as a child. He was very interested in painting, drawing, sculptures. It wasn't until later in life when he got into the, the fashion and fabrics. He uh, enrolled in Oklahoma A&M College, which would become Oklahoma State University. But he did take some uh, classes in home economics, and that's where he was like, first exposed to uh, the idea of, of fabrics. He learned how to identify different fabrics for men's clothing, and that kind of set that spark for him to eventually enter fashion. He wound up quitting Oklahoma A&M just because of, you know, lack of interest, and he wanted to find a different direction. He kind of went through a, a depression, and his uh, mother and sister were really concerned about it. They went to uh, Muskogee to visit the Indian agent there at the office of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they asked if they could give a student loan for him to go to the Art Institute in Chicago. And they did it, and so that's how he wound up going there, and that's where he got his art education to become an arts educator himself. After he graduated from Chicago, he moved to Phoenix to begin teaching, and then that's when he got caught up in the war. But after the war, he returned to the Phoenix area to kind of pick up where he left off, and he established his shop, his fashion shop, making the bags and things in Scottsdale, which at the time was uh, starting to really develop into this uh, center for uh, lots of handcrafted items and things, and he was on the forefront of that. Lloyd was one of the first uh, native fashion designers but he was the first one to bring it to a very successful and popular venture where uh, people would recognize that native designs and fashions were very uh, unique and very valuable. Just outside Phoenix, where a lot of galleries and artist studios were, that's where he and Charles Lolima first started collaborating in the Kiva studio in Scottsdale, Arizona in the 1950s. He really was an innovator in native fashion. Um, he did things that people had never done before. Um, and one of the things was incorporating uh, images, designs, and traditions, not only from his own Cherokee background, but from the native backgrounds and traditions in the Southwest where he made his home. Aside from his innovation, his work and others became mainstream. So these cocktail dresses from the 1950s were available in high-end department stores in Denver, Los Angeles, and New York. It wasn't just in Santa Fe or in, in the Southwest, but they were really part of the mainstream uh, American culture in these department stores in major cities all over the country. And he collaborated with many people as well. That was an important factor and influence in his work. 
he reached back home, there was the Sequoia Weavers Association, which made a lot of the uh, their own textiles, and they were selling things to some of the same department stores. And so they had this partnership in which they would design and make textiles for him, and he would make the clothing and sell them to all these other places. Uh, they wound up showing their work at the uh, Fashion Expo in New York City, so their work was gaining really large exposure. And that really caught the attention of, of not just that local area, but the world. People like Eleanor Roosevelt would come and buy things from him, and people like Frank Lloyd Wright as his friend, so he had a really great circle of people around him. Both Lloyd Kivenu and Charles Lolima were such innovators that many people here in the States, native and non-native, thought their designs and artwork and jewelry went too far and was so contemporary that it wasn't really native anymore. But when they, the two of them had this successful runway show in Paris in 1963, and the French raved about how creative and artistic their designs were, the Americans started to really take notice and say, oh, well, that, yeah, no, we, we like that stuff too. Looking at Lloyd New's career and the reaction of people to his work, we've been having this conversation for a long time. What is Native art? How is it defined? And who is doing the defining? It really should be the Native artists who are doing the defining. At the height of his career as a designer, he had this uh, international acclaim. Uh, and then he decided to refocus his efforts on Native uh, arts education, and that was in the the late 50s, early 60s. And soon after that, that's when he began planning IAIA, the establishment of the Institute for American Indian Arts. So he was an art director and then he became a president. He was an instructor. In this time, this was during the mid 20th century, people were recognizing that native art was a very uniquely American thing. And I think trying to get, uh, teach young artists to recognize that their own artworks and art forms were valid. The idea was to create a progressive model for Native students to go to where they could express themselves as Native people. As an arts educator, one of the biggest uh, parts of his legacy is telling Native artists that you define what Native art is. There's this conception in the popular imagination of what Native art is supposed to be, uh, but his philosophy was basically that as Native artists, we are Natives making art, and what we make is Native art. Next time on OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People. What I, I want is for people to uh, take us seriously, Native people. Cherokee artist Daniel Horsechief and his perspectives on life and art. What he hopes his larger-than-life sculptures portray to the world around them. Join us for that story and more on the next OCO Voices of the Cherokee People. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at OCO.TV. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, Dona Dago Ha'i. We'll see each other again. So until next time, Wado.